Welcome into Ball. He is ESPN's Tom Lugabill. I am Ryan Brown. A massive matchup in college football this weekend. We're finally getting Penn State, Ohio State, and Michigan to start playing one another. We will discuss that with Tom Lugabill, plus Alabama, Tennessee, plus Auburn, Ole Miss, plus a burgeoning, maybe, favorite to win their conference. That's all coming up on the show today. Presented to you by MyBookie.ag, code next round. MyBookie.ag, code next round. Sign on, make that initial deposit, and get a 110% bonus that is free money from mybookie.ag when you use code next round. What's up, Lugs? How are you today? I am fantastic. Fantastic. It's hard not to be. We are in October, the greatest sports month of the year. The weather's awesome. The football's great. <laughs> and we got a good one in the Big Ten this weekend as Penn State goes in for that early kick against Ohio State. Uh, the stat Penn State has excelled in the most this year is time of possession. They lead the nation in time of possession. That's like a forgotten stat, isn't it, Luke? About how many times do you talk time of possession anymore? Uh, not often. I, I think I think it can be a bit deceiving. Does it matter? Yes, but I do think it can be deceiving. Um, but the bottom line is when you look at the opponents and how they've played Penn State, they keep giving Penn State the ball. Like yeah. <laughs> that's, And the other thing that's interesting about it is not only do they give Penn State the ball, but you'll look at the box score and you'll see Drew Aller have three touchdowns or four touchdowns, but finish the game with like 160 yards passing. Like something's not right. So they're getting the ball on short field a lot of the time. Um, and I, you know, this time around against Ohio State, you're on the road and you know, are, are you going to be able to count on having that many possessions or possessing the ball for that long against a team of Ohio State's caliber? I don't know. I, this is such a show me game, Brownie. I don't know how you feel about it. But this is this is one of those games where we've watched Ohio State, we've watched Michigan, we've watched Penn State, and I feel like I know what my eyes are are telling me. But I want to see them actually go out and do it, you know. And yeah. Alabama and Texas have had to play each other, and Oklahoma's had to play a Texas. And Ohio State did have to go on the road and 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 play a Notre Dame. We don't know yet. It's a great. I told Jim on Monday. It's a great defining moment for James Franklin because he has to come up with a way of winning these games, particularly with the team he's got this year. Yeah, the game, of course, is in the horseshoe. Early game on Fox there. So if they are going to tame the shoe, Penn State has to do what? What does Penn State have to do? I mentioned time of possession. Obviously, it would help if you don't let Ohio State have the ball. Yeah. But what does Penn State have to do to pull the upset and win this game? I think they've got to get Kyle McCord uncomfortable. we got to understand that with this Ohio State team, they are limping into this game. You notice they did not have Mayan Williams, did not have Travion Henderson last week, had to go almost exclusively exclusively to Chip Tranium, who I think is a really good player, by the way. Um, and and the offensive line has been a bit of work in progress. It hasn't been Arkansas. It hasn't been Alabama. Right. But it has still been a bit of work, of work in progress. And the strength for Penn State is their front. Chop Robinson, uh, Danny Dennis Sutton, um, Isaac Adisa, or Adisa Isaac, excuse me, um, they can flat out get after it, and they can disrupt you. And if Ohio State uh, is struggling from a depth standpoint to consistently run the football, and 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 are and they're not able to maybe get ahead of the chains, that defensive front for Penn State. Listen, the defensive front and the linebacking core for for Penn State is really really good. Abdul Carter, that whole crew, they got NFL guys at all three levels on that defense. So. It's going to be a challenge. I don't think there's any – it is going to be a challenge. But you know what? I think it's going to be a challenge for both teams. I, I think that, you know, for the first time, we're going to see a Penn State offense have to play well on the road against somebody that's really, really good. So I feel like what Kyle McCord, though, Lugs, is like uh, coming out of the Indiana game week one, everybody was like, boy, they are not good at quarterback. I mean, right, they are yeah. struggling at quarterback. And then he kind of climbed up a little bit. And then a lot of that Notre Dame game, you're like, yeah, that's kind of what I thought about Kyle McCord. Then he leads that game-winning drive. And you're like, yeah. hey, I, I, no, I believe in Kyle McCord. Comes back against Maryland, and you're like, I don't know about Kyle McCord. Great against second Purdue. half, though. Yeah, great second half, and then Purdue. So, I mean, this is a guy that's he's giving you moments to really love him, and he's giving you moments to wonder, is he really as good as I think he is? Uh, you, you say it's a show-me game. I think it is for Kyle McCord, too, obviously, right? We don't. Well, I, I'm not sure we really know what he is. I, I think it's, it's so true what you say, not just about Kyle McCord, but we could say that about um, – we could say that about Jalen Milrow at Alabama yeah, in week two. Yeah. We could say that about Carson Beck at Clemson, or excuse me, at Georgia in week two. And look at all of those guys we've been discussing that are now just playing, and they're in six, seven weeks, and they've all gotten just slightly incrementally better. And I think we're going to continue to see them get better. I, I think it's unfair for anybody to expect that 
you know, Kyle McCord is going to come in and be CJ Stroud um, and, and be CJ Stroud right off the bat. And so now maybe next year we'll see that, but I just think that he keeps gaining confidence. He's getting better and better and better. And, um, and it, he, again, has a moment like he had at the end of the Notre Dame game uh, to finish against Maryland. He's got an opportunity to show that he's taking the next step. They've got the weapons around him. I, know, I mentioned the injuries on uh, at the running back spot. But he's done a much better job, in my opinion, of getting the ball out of his hands. He yeah. looks more confident. He looks more authoritative in his throws. He did not look like that in the first two to three weeks. Um, so you've done a game at the Horseshoe before, right? Or multiple sure. games. Sure. I've actually yeah, yeah. I've had the privilege of doing Ohio State, Michigan in the game, in the game where JT Barrett went down. Right. And they had already lost Braxton Miller. Yep. And then Cardell Jones Cardell, comes yeah. in yeah. and beats Michigan on that yep. day. And the rest is history. A national championship would ensue. Yeah, I uh, I went to this summer. I went to see Chris Stapleton and George Strait there together. Nice. Yeah, it's a phenomenal concert, and um, that it's weird how big that stadium is, but how kind of quaint it feels. Like it's a massive stadium, but when you're inside of it, I, it just felt like and look, there was you know seating on the field and a concert stage and all that. But I felt like you feel like you're right on top of the action uh, on the TV. It doesn't necessarily look that way if I'm describing it right. I, I don't know if you got the same yeah. feeling. So it is a, you're right. If we were going to take it and compare it to like a Rose Bowl or even the University of Michigan. Right, right. Those stadiums at the fields here, yep. those stadiums go up like this. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you're really far out, right? And at Ohio State, the field's here and it goes like this. That's right. Yep. And it yep. circles all the way around. So it is quaint. They are right on top of you. Um, It is loud. It's one of the re- the biggest difference between a Michigan home game and an Ohio State home game. There are times at Michigan that 110,000 people sounds like 40. Right. But you could have 60 capacity at the horseshoe, and it would sound like 90. Yeah. So I, I do think it's a, it's a great home field advantage. You, if you're in the box, you sit way up and you're looking down. Um, but it does. It, keep, it keeps the sound in, no doubt. Yeah. By the way, Chris Stapleton in concert sounds recorded. It sounds like he's singing on a track. You know, George Strait is just – He's singing his hits, right? Sitting on and his chair. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Walking around smiling like he's just made a billion dollars, which he has. Yeah. And, uh, but Stapleton, man, it sounds like it is tracked. That guy is so good. He is unbelievable. I, I, you know, it's interesting with him because I love how, you know, he had written all these songs and he had been producing and writing for everybody else. And he says, eh, I'll just release my own album of whatever songs nobody wanted. That's right. And he didn't even have to write them to make the album. They were already written. He just said, I'll just throw it out there. <laughs> I know, I know. And then I'll cover a George Jones song and I'll make a billion yeah. off of it. Yeah. Why not? Uh, he is ESPN's Tom Lugaville. This is Ball with Tom Lugaville. It is presented each week by mybookie.ag. Code next round when you sign on and uh, make that initial deposit there at mybookie.ag. They match at 110%. That is free money. Play with it right away. It is yours and yours forever if you win that first time at mybookie.ag. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with mybookie.ag. And Lugaville also present by uh, presented by Manscaped. We've got your Manscaped product, right? You love it. I do not. I'm still waiting. I told Lancer. I told him. I said, "Listen, I'm 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 getting grizzled here. I mean, look at this. I'm gonna even have to use it on the back of my head right here. I mean, with this thing getting out of hand." Do you want me to yell? Do you want me to yell at the shipping department real quick to make sure? Yeah, right now, give a holler. Let's go. (laughs) Manscaped.com. You can use all that great Manscaped product, and uh, right now. With the code BROWN20, that is BROWN20, you're going to save 20% on your initial order there at manscaped.com when you use code BROWN20. Um, and we're going to get it to, to Lugaville. And when you get it, you're absolutely going to love it. I promise you it is in the mail, Lugaville. Hearing it's Jim read this promo is classic because he's so <laughs> <What>? uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I use the I use the beard hedger. I use it all the time. That's what I want to do, yeah. You, well, hey, you're going to love the beard hedger. And here's what you're going right. to love most about it because you're probably like me. You've been looking for a good one just to keep it trimmed down a little bit. Yeah. And you got you know how you got the guards that slide on and slide off? Yeah. And if they pop off, at the if that guard pops off at the wrong time, guess what you don't have anymore? <laughs> a beard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is this has got the dial and you can choose your links and it's got all, you know, so from everything from a zero, I think up to nine and a half or ten. Love it. Yeah, yeah. So the beard hedger is what you've got, the lawnmower uh to take care of uh the undercarriage there. That's the part um, that's funny. Yeah, that's the part you like. The weed whacker takes care of the the <laughs> nose hairs and the ear hairs, so you don't look like an old man. You could get it all right there uh at manscaped.com. Manscaped.com use code Brown20. To save 20% off your initial order, code BROWN20 at manscaped.com. All right, let's talk some Bama, Tennessee, Dixieland Delight, the song Alabama yeah. plays, talks about a Tennessee Saturday night. 
This is a long-standing rivalry. You got to hear Dixieland Delight standing there in Bryant-Denny Stadium for a minute. I thought you were going to hear it with an easy win, Alabama coasting to victory, fans just singing their song. By the time Dixieland Delight played, there were some nervous people in that stadium. You know, it, it was so interesting because when the face mask occurred is when everything for some reason changed. He he was he was he was running and waving the surrender flag. That's the wildest thing about that, Lugs, is I know. Sam Pittman was waving the white flag. I think it was third and eight. They ran the football. Alabama yeah. easily stopped them. They were going to punt and give it back to Alabama uh with the mm -hmm. clock moving and the score 24 to 6. He had waved the white flag. That game was over. It really was. And it just shows you what life can breathe into the game for your sideline when you have something extended that's unexpected, and all of a sudden you have a couple of positive plays after. Now the entire approach and mindset's different. I, I had told our Dusty and Dave we were in the break, and the touchdown that ensued off of that was was KJ Jefferson throwing the slant off the RPO in the end zone. And it was the, it was one of two throws I saw all day that KJ Jefferson made with authority. Yeah. He looked like he looked like a quarterback should look. The rest of the day he was tentative. He was out of sorts. He was out of sync, um, almost to the point where it seemed a little bit disinterested um, on offense. They couldn't block anybody. They can't run the football. But that got him back in the game. But I think another reason why it got him back in the game, and we said this on the broadcast, and we're still kind of scratching our head about it, is Alabama came out in the third quarter, and it was, we're going to impose our will on you. We're going to run the football, Arkansas. We obviously are struggling to block you, particularly at left tackle against Landon Jackson. We're just going to line up and run it down your throat. And you know what? That's exactly what they did. So what does Alabama do the next couple of series? They come out and they throw the ball over the lot. What are they? One for nine at quarterback. Uh, multiple punts. So yep. that, too, coinciding with that extended drive is what lent to a lot of Arkansas's confidence to get back into the game. I, listen, the better team won. Um, and I, I joke, I was joking with somebody that said, you know what? Somehow, some way, Alabama is going to screw around and find a way to get into the college football playoff. It's like it's just weird, and and the and the margin of error is so slim, right? You've got the Texas loss. Every game is a playoff game now. The sense of urgency is at an all time high. I mean, it's it's nuts, and they keep coming up with ways to get out of their own way, like the penalties once again. I mean, the you have a procedure penalty when you're taking a knee. Yeah, this is not taking a knee. Yeah, well, and it's and and there was an even more alarming aspect to that is the reason you have the procedure penalty is because Jermaine Burton is chirping yeah. across the line of scrimmage at a team you should have beaten by three or four touchdowns, and you're going to yeah. be lucky to win the game. I don't know why he's chirping, and Jace McClellan is trying to get him to shut up. I know, and, and he's moving when Milrow takes the snap. Saban loses his, you know, blows a gasket. Oh. But I mean, I'll give McClellan credit. He's he's trying to tell Jermaine Burton, shut up, look at the scoreboard. We're lucky to win this game. Why are you chirping? Yeah, and and again, it's it's all of the self-inflicted wounds and the penalties and the sloppy play, and trying to figure out, you know, how are they going to put this offensive line together where whether, whether it gives them a chance. Uh, the bottom line is, I their offensive line to me is like Auburn's offense. This is what you're going to get, and you're probably going to get some version of this every single week for the rest of the year. It may not be 100% correctable or fixable. You're going to have to work around it and come up with a way. And it's yeah. probably going to be ugly, and it's probably not going to be pretty. But this is what we've seen, and we're going on to week eight. This is probably what we're going to continue to see. Can they withstand the storm, though, playing that way? Yeah, so as it pertains to offensive line, when you look at sack leaders in the nation, Alabama right now is uh, tied for third with James Madison. They've mm -hmm. got 26 sacks. And the next two tied at fifth with 24 sacks. The Jacksonville State University, my old school, in Tennessee. That's go bad Cox. news. That's bad. Yes, go Cox. That's bad news for Alabama, though. Yeah. The way they have struggled at left tackle is they are playing a team in Tennessee that can flat get after the quarterback. Now, Alabama does it too, but Tennessee yeah. hasn't been as suspect in the offensive line as Alabama has. Uh, no, they haven't. Actually, Tennessee in the offensive line is maybe one of the better units in the league, particularly on the ground, which tells me that Tennessee can come up with other ways to win the football game. You know, I said something this morning that got passed around social media, and of course Tennessee fans are all bent out of shape at me because they live their life being bent out of shape at just about anybody that says something that they don't agree with. But Texas A&M is a better team. They have better players, right? They go in, they got beat by Tennessee. 
Do I think Tennessee is really the, the better team, the better roster right now than Texas A&M? Probably yeah. not, but they won the game, all right? Yeah. They won the game because they did a couple of things. And this is going to be important as it pertains to this coming week going on the road. They won the game because they could do the one thing that nobody else, Tennessee, could do the one thing that nobody else has proven to be able to do, and that's run the football against Texas A&M. And had they not been able to run the football, they were in serious trouble. They couldn't throw it a lick. Joe Milton was extremely oh. erratic. Yep. Now, they had some drops. They had some red zone opportunities where they didn't capitalize and they did not execute. They know that. So they left some points on the field. Um, but the bottom line is, this is not the same team we've seen uh, from the last two years of Tennessee. You know, if you look at Joe Milton in the passing game right now, he's averaging just about 6.9 yards uh, per attempt, right? <laughs> last year, Hennon Hooker averaged almost 10, almost 10. Joe Milton's already thrown four interceptions. Hennon Hooker threw two all of last year. Yep. So – they're having to work around some of this stuff and they were able to do it because the defense showed up and came to play and the kicking game made a huge, huge difference from Tennessee. When they made that punt and it downed inside the one yard line and they had the stop and now all of a sudden A&M's punt and D Williams returns it. That, that was the difference in the game. It was. They ran the ball, they played defense and they had the kicking game. You go on the road. If you can run the ball, play some defense, and win in the kicking game, you've got a tremendous chance to win the game. I I kind of feel like Alabama and Tennessee are very similar at quarterback. Kind of what you see is what you get. You're going to see some really good. You're going to see probably some not so good. And most times you're going to see somewhere uh, in between. But Tennessee is clearly the better team in the offensive front right now. Yeah. Lead the so, league in rushing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just it's such a different team, and Alabama is too, without Bryce yeah. Young. It's such a different team uh without Hendon Hooker. They just they're leaning more on their defense sure. and less on their offense. And last year, their their pass defense last year was abysmal. Everybody that played them had their career day, except for Will Levis, who oddly threw for yeah. like 98 yards against them. Is that but odd every, or is that kind of what he is? I, that's true. <laughs> that's a, it, it turns out that was exactly who Will Levis was. But everybody would have a career day against them. And yeah. this year, it's not the case anymore. And they're just a different the team. They're, they're a different the team. Yeah. Yeah. I, your, your front, the pressure bursts the pipe. You know, yeah. you want to protect your back end a little bit, disrupt the quarterback, get him off center, get him off cue, um, get him on the ground. Don't have to always be sacks. But your secondary looks really, really good when the quarterback's under duress. That's the bottom line. And, and Tennessee deserves credit for that. Um, I'm just interested to see what they do on the road, too. That That's the other yep. thing. Like, this was a team, and by the way, did you know that Florida's five and two? How did Florida yeah, they get are, five and two? Uh, you know, and, <laughs> I, and I, I said this to Peter Burns yesterday. Well, so first of all, the only other time Tennessee's really going to a hostile road environment, it did not go well. They they did not. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm why saying. you that's bring why up Florida. Florida. Yeah, yeah, I brought up Florida. Yeah, uh, if you told Florida fans you're five and two through seven games, I think most Florida fans will look at it and said, okay, that's a step in the right direction. I'd rather be you know seven and zero, oh, six and one. But five well, and they two. They didn't lose to two right. chumps. No, no. I mean, they lost to Utah and Kentucky. Now, the way the Kentucky game went, you you yeah. can't stomach that one. Yeah. You know, they were never in that game. But I think if you had told them five and two, they would have probably said, okay. But it just, they don't feel like a five and two team at all. No, they don't. They don't. But I bring them up because Tennessee on the yep. road just did not play well against a team that is not in Alabama's class right now. So, you know, how, how do they show up? Listen, that was a big confidence win for Tennessee. Um, I've kind of felt to some degree that they've been maybe slightly overranked a little bit based off of last year's accolades. Right. But they won the game, right? Yeah. And so now they got to go on the road. And as I mentioned with Alabama, Alabama's sitting there with zero room for error. Zero. Do you like the song Dixieland Delight? I love it. And I took yeah. my phone out. I was standing on the north end zone. And we were in a, one of our longer commercial breaks. And that thing went on for a lot longer than a minute. Yeah. And and I just took my phone out and I just panned on video towards the south because the way they get the pom-poms going with it, right, right. it's just such a cool look. You know, it's 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 a great look. Cool story uh, at AL.com, if you want to go look it up. Uh, the guy that wrote the song, Michael Casagrande did the, the article. The guy that wrote the song was in Bryant-Denny for the first time in his life Saturday and saw right. the crowd sing it. And Michael was with him when he did it. 
and was just talking about his reaction. The guy that wrote the song, right? I mean, that's awesome. So, so Alabama yeah, he, didn't write that song, or is that a member of Alabama? No, no. Uh, it's, I think Ronnie Rogers is the guy's name. I think he a lot, wrote a lot of songs for Alabama. I think it was okay, one of their main it. songwriters. Yeah, got it. Yeah, uh, Alabama, another group I have seen numerous times back in their heyday when everybody was, you know, still alive and a little bit younger. Yeah. And uh, boy, they put on a show. I don't know if you ever Great saw them band. at concert. Alabama put on a show. I don't know how you get that many. I mean, that many songs. It's like, yeah. you know, you hear about Garth Brooks, you hear about Elvis yep. Presley, but that, but like, it almost felt like there was a span of like 10 years where there wasn't a song they put out that wasn't like, like a top five hit or a number one hit. I think hit. they had 40 number one hits, if not more. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. Yeah, that's a 40? crazy amount. Yeah, 40 something like Dang. that. They went to number one on the college, uh, the, the uh, country charts. Yeah. Um, yeah, great band. Really, really good live show. Fort Payne, and, Alabama. Uh, Fort Payne, Alabama. And Randy Owen, lead singer. Jacksonville State. It's all full circle. All comes back to Jacksonville State, right? <laughs> it is ball with ESP and Stom Lukeville presented each week by mybookie.ag, code next round. Mybookie.ag, code next round. You make that initial deposit. They match it 110% when you use code next round. That is free money. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with mybookie.ag. They're literally, literally giving you free money to do it with that 110% sign on bonus. Mybookie.ag, code next round. Mybookie.ag, code next round. Also, our apparel provided by Roback, Roback.com to uh, check out those soft hoodies they've got, the quarter zips. It is quarter zip season out. I love a good quarter zip. They got those at Roback, the golf shirts, and they just sent us some of their new pants. I, I, I told some, Peter Burns, it's like wearing pajama pants, but you can wear them to church. They're comfortable and they look great. You can get all that at Roback.com, code TNR20 at checkout uh, to save 20% off your initial order. TNR20 saves you 20% off your initial order. Ole Miss comes to Auburn. This is a beaten up Auburn team after losing, emotionally beaten up, after losing the way they did at uh, at LSU. Ole Miss coming off a win over LSU, then a bye week. Uh, yeah. if, if you're Lane Kiffin, would would you have liked that bye week there? I, it was a it's a track meet game against Ole Miss, but it was also the yeah. biggest win he's probably had at Ole Miss. You know, sometimes it's interesting when and where a bye comes, depending on your overall health, depending on if you're needing to get somebody back and you just need that one more extra week, you just, you welcome it, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it came right smack dab almost directly into the middle of the season. But then there's other times too where, and I have Oklahoma UCF this week, and, you know, you have a game like Oklahoma had against Texas, and to avoid having your kids basking in the glow for two yeah. whole weeks, get caught yeah. up in everything, you'd kind of like to just get right back on the field. And I'm not saying that's the case with Ole Miss, but when you have that momentum and you have that high of having a huge win like that, total track meet, white knuckler, you almost want to just go right into the next one. But at the same time, you're probably exhausted. So, you know, I, th I think Lane Kiffin would feel better about this game if he were at home because to some degree, you know, Ole Miss is a little like Louisville out of the ACC. They haven't shown to be the same team on the road that they have been at home. You know, yeah. if you remember, I, I had the game against Tulane. They were very fortunate to come out of there. Um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, the loss to Alabama was a, a fairly big one. And so this is not the place you want to go on the road to. I mean, that's the one thing. I don't care if you're an Auburn fan, Alabama fan, if you're a Washington fan, if you're a Texas fan, if you've ever been to Jordan Hare Stadium, and I don't care if it's a 330 kick, but particularly at night, either way, that that is a really really daunting environment, and they can get you off. They can get you off schedule just from the noise alone, because it's constant. It never it never lets up, and so I think Lane Kiffin's more than aware of that. He's dealt with it before, but he also knows the realities of it. So they're gonna they're gonna have to be dialed in from a procedure penalty standpoint. Really important that they win on first down because when they win on first down. It enables them to go fast. You go fast and get Auburn on their heels, you quiet the crowd down. But I've said all along, and I saw it before we saw them in person, and I feel like this since, they're not the same team when they don't dictate terms to the defense. When they have to slow down because things maybe aren't working out, they're a different team. They just are. So Hugh Freeze was asked in his press conference on Monday, when you watch Ole Miss play and the pace at which they play and – you know, the way they run the football, all those things. Is that what you want your offense to be? And he said, absolutely. So the future for freeze. Uh, it, it, and this may be a tough question to ask, but you follow recruiting. You know personnel. Sure. You know rosters. Um, what percentage of his roster does he 
that he needs does he have to to be at that level? So in other words, you know, if we're from zero to he's nowhere close to being able to run the offense he wants to 100% where Hugh Freeze has every weapon he wants, how far along that timeline do you feel like this Auburn roster is right now? God, I want I don't want this to sound awful, but maybe 20 to 25 percent. Mean, that's the number I had in mind. That's what it feels uh, like. Yeah. And, but you know what? If you ask him that question, he'd probably be behind closed doors tell you the same thing. Yeah. But I'll say this: he was asked that question. You could probably ask that question of 60 power five coaches right now, sure. and they'd give you the same answer. Yeah, yeah I want to be old. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, they're pretty damn good. Right. But it is the style Freeze ran, right? When he was yes. at Ole Miss. Yeah. I mean, he he said it a couple of times and he says it, and then he realized well, it sounds a little arrogant, so I'm gonna back it back down, but Basically, he introduced this style of play to the Southeastern Conference. He and Gus Malzahn came on about the same time in this hurry-up, no huddle that kept the Nick Saban defenses, the Kirby Smart defenses on their heels a little bit. Well, that and the the thing is, is at at its core, it is a sometimes two-back play-action team with a bunch of window dressing, a bunch of eye candy, a lot of backfield movement, shifts, motions, um, a bunch of stuff happening post snap, and it's all designed to get you on defense. When the ball is going over there, and you're looking over there, you yep. got a problem, right? Yep. And and it can take just one false step. So they're really good at influencing the defense. And if you're doing that, and you get hot on the ground, because at the end of the day, man, watch Lane Kiffin's offense. Watch that they're a run first, no power football team. Yep, they might look flashy because of all the shiny toys. They're laying around the bottom of the tree. But at, at their core, that's what they are. I think that's what Hugh Freeze wants to be. Um, you know, the, the, here where Hugh Freeze does not have a Quinshawn Judkin. He does not have a Trey Harris, all right? He certainly doesn't have a Jackson Dart right now. But <laughs> let's just say let's just say that in recruiting and with the transfer portal, in a year's time, you could go out and get all three of those guys in one cycle. That's right. You really, yeah. you really could. Now you couldn't have done that five years ago, but you can now. Um, and again, I look to a team like Florida State. Like Florida State, the job they've done in the transfer portal that has completely transformed their entire program in the span of like two and a half years. It's remarkable. So with the resources that Auburn has and the recruiting prowess and name, image, and likeness, and you know, portal access. Uh, they'll get there. I mean, they, they will get there because quarterbacks will want to play in that offense. I really believe that. Does the film show that they are as far off in the passing game as the numbers show? Because they're off. I mean, numbers-wise, they're terrible. And yeah. when you watch the game, it looks like Thorne just – he's got zero confidence. He can't see open receivers. If he finds them open, he can't get the ball to them. When you watch yeah. the film, are they as far off as it looks? I think they are. Um, but I think a lot of it, too, is they've become – so quarterback run centric because they right now they don't have anything else. Yeah. So now everybody that goes into that thing goes, well, we know what they're going to do. Right. We dare you to do the other stuff. And um, and if you beat us in the passing game, okay, great. Could you do it twice? Yeah. Could you then do it a third time? But I mean, could Auburn go out on offense and have a four touchdown day through the air? I don't know. No. Not not from what we've seen so far. Yeah. So people are just daring them to throw it and. Um, and it's got to be incredibly frustrating for Hugh Freeze and 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 their entire staff. And I, I again, I go back to the off season and I remember the transfer portal, and it just immediately came like right into my mind. I was like, Spencer Sanders, Auburn. Yep. And it didn't happen. And now that yep. guy is sitting as a backup at Ole Miss, and I feel like that would have just been the most perfect marriage for what Hugh Freeze wants to be—a great stopgap guy to kind of get you through. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen. Yeah. And I think they thought Peyton Thorne might be that too, but it's just, it's not yeah. working. And to your point, and it's, I thought of this as you brought it up, you are leaning so heavily on the quarterback run. Um, is that maybe encouraging Thorne to, or discouraging him from going through his reads as much? I mean, heck, if, if, if they're calling runs, if I don't have my first guy open, maybe I get to my second guy, I'm pulling down and going. I mean, I'm, I'm just not going to stand back here and let it develop. Yeah, potentially yes, and yeah. I and it, they just don't seem to have a lot of confidence in it, right? I mean, they you don't. look at last week. You look at last week. Two of their top three rushers were both of the quarterbacks. That's not that's not good. That's not what they want to be. Um, and so, and especially when you're not talking about staggering numbers, this right. is really the one thing that they can kind of hang their hat on 
And it wasn't as if they just went out there and blew the doors off. Uh, but again, as we talked about last week, they were playing against a team that you can't get behind against if you are in Auburn's position right now offensively. Yeah, normally you can have a night like that, though, and you're like, well, yeah, it was LSU's defense, though. It's a great game. But this is the – everybody has moved yeah. in on LSU. Yeah. So, it, yeah. Uh, Harold Perkins, finally – I mean, he looked like a stud in that game. I, I would have guessed 10 tackles. I think it was only five. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's just – it's it's tough for Auburn's offense right now. They just cannot get it going. Uh, it is ball with ESPN's Tom Luganbill. We're going to wrap up talking about an ACC team that is all of a sudden looking like maybe a contender in that conference. And what's it mean for the college football playoff picture? Ball is presented by mybookie.ag, code next round. Mybookie.ag, code next round. Make that initial deposit. Use code next round to get 110% of your uh, deposit as a sign-on bonus. That 110% sign-on bonus is free money from mybookie.ag. When you use code next round, bet anything, anytime, anywhere with mybookie.ag, code next round. Mybookie.ag. Don't forget to use code next round. Also, when you're looking for games to play, Lance'sLock.com coming off a 2-0 on Monday night with um, Major League Baseball in the playoffs and also the NFL in Monday night football. You can get the plays at Lance'sLock.com. Uh, they got daily packages, weekly packages, monthly packages, full season, right there starting as low as uh, under $100. Lance'sLock.com, Lance'sLock.com. All of a sudden, here are... The North Carolina Tar Heels. Miami <laughs> has kind of played their way out of any sort of ACC contention with a bonehead play at the end of the Georgia Tech game and then getting drilled by North Carolina. Drake May is being Drake May, and Tez Walker looked like an absolute stud against that Miami defense. With those weapons, how big a contender is this in the ACC? Um, I think they are a legitimate contender. But they they don't have very uh, a very big uh, margin of error either. Yeah. Um, they're still somewhat thin. They're an above average team in the offensive line. I don't think they're a, a good or great team after seeing them in person. The receiving core is already strong, and that was without Tez Walker. And Tez Walker is a handful. He's a problem. The biggest difference has been Chip Lindsey, the new offensive coordinator, who has come in there and essentially said. We're going to bloody your nose at the point of attack. We're going to run it and run it and run it and run it and see if you can stop us. And so far, Omarion Hampton and British Brooks have been the real deal. They are a really physical football team. And if you if you peel back the layers, it looks like Drake May is not having the same year. He's actually playing better. He's actually thrown for more yards than he did last year to this point versus much better competition. He just has more help. It doesn't all have to fall on his shoulders. Whereas last year, they were having to score from distance so yeah. often because they couldn't run the footballs effectively. And they they didn't have, a, you know, an inside the five-yard line run game. What's happened now is they've just had, just by circumstance, Drake May is still throwing these great tosses, this and that, and, they, and a guy will catch it, and somehow the play will end at the four-yard line. Like, he won't get in. Whereas a year ago, yeah. he got in. So what happens? They go out, and they line up, and boom, they pound you. So all of a sudden, his touchdown numbers aren't what they were a year ago. Defensively, Relative to what they were a year ago, meaning that they were atrocious, you could then say that they are exceptional. They probably lie somewhere in between because it's such a stark contrast to last year. But they're deeper in the defensive front. And here's the thing that's interesting about them. Their two best additions to the transfer portal is a group of five player and an FCS player. And that sounds odd, right? Yeah. You're sitting there going, well, why are they upgrades? Well, for the first part I just said, North Carolina was that bad on defense. But here, the, Mac Brown gave a great answer to this. He goes, when we go into the transfer portal and we see somebody that has been ridiculously productive, we're going to really study that guy. So Elijah Huzzy is the one. He's from East Tennessee State. He had 12 interceptions during his tenure there. Super instinctive, just wasn't very big, right? The other guy, Sticky Lane, he had 11 interceptions at Georgia State, probably the best secondary player they had. So now they've just upgraded their secondary with a bunch of ball hawks. They didn't come from power five schools in the snap, but here's the key. Those guys are so hungry to prove themselves. Yeah. They want nothing in return. They're not asking for NIL money. They want to play in a power five conference, and they will do whatever it takes to get it done. And it's transformed their defense. And I, you know, I'd like to think that more teams are kind of going to start taking that approach too. There's a lot of great football players out there that have played three or four years at their spot that are going to have a year of eligibility left, 
and can and can play. So they can't get injured. I think that's the biggest thing, Brownie. They cannot get injured. They're, 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 they don't have that type of depth yet. Yeah, their next three are Virginia. I know it's Virginia this Saturday. I think they'll they be play- heavily favored in all three. Oh gosh, yes, like Campbell and then Georgia Tech. Yeah. So the rest of this month, pretty easy sailing for them. But then Don't they count close- out the camels, the camel, the camel, camels. camels, baby. Then they close out though with Duke, who should have Riley Leonard back healthy by then. You would yeah. think uh, Clemson, and that is in Death Valley, and then NC State, who has been a disappointing team this year. So it is a bit of a tough finish for North Carolina. By the way, speaking of Duke, you think they're any good on defense? So they beat NC State 24 to 3. Now listen, they beat NC State 24 to 3. They were 4 of 12 in the passing game. Yeah. They were 1 of 9, 1 of 9 on the third down and turned the ball over twice and won yeah. the game. That dude Duke is for real on defense, bro. I'm telling if, you. If you gave Mike Elko one do-over and he doesn't rush 3 against Notre Dame, they're an undefeated oh, on the, team on the fourth down. On the fourth down, yeah, he rushed yeah. three. It was it, he. I don't. I don't. I haven't watched the film. I don't know how many times he rushed three that game. But it was the right call because you're doing it against a guy that you never think's going to take off and run on you. What would he do? Uh, he took off and ran on him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one but more he, yard than he needed. I know. If he if he could do that one play over, you know, uh-huh. you, you you rush four, you pressure him, whatever. You're undefeated. And they're knocking on the door of the top ten. But know. you know, one play changed it all. They're still pretty good though. Still pretty good. All right, uh, it is ball with ESPN's Tom Lukeville. You know, I saw this morning. Uh, it's funny. Uh, I knew you had uh, UCF Oklahoma, but I, I'd, yeah. forgotten where the, I'd forgotten where the game was. And I saw this morning they're tracking a storm in the Atlantic. You know, they think it might become a hurricane. And I'm like, oh, I bet it's going to hit Orlando Saturday. Lugs is there, but no. <laughs> Please, no, you're don't in hit Norman. Orlando. Just don't hit Norman. <laughs> Norman, yes. Hopefully it's it just... 85 degrees. Are we're you the, kidding we're me? Late October. What is happening? No, oh, it's not supposed to be 85 degrees. No. Yes. No. Go talk uh, to your manscaping guys. What are you doing? Uh, yeah, get get Luke scaped. Um, UFC right. at Oklahoma, 11 o'clock ABC, 11 Central, 12 UCF. Eastern. Uh, UFC, UCF. Either way. Or UFC, either one. Uh, it is in Norman. <laughs> it's going to be hot. Lugabill will be cleanly shaved by them because we're going to make sure the manscape gets there. Uh, Brown 20. Brown 20 for 20% off at uh, your first order at manscaped.com. TNR 20 for 20% off your first order at roback.com. And also, don't forget code next round with mybookie.ag, code next round, mybookie.ag, uh, to get that 110% sign on bonus with your initial deposit there at mybookie.ag. All right, enjoy Norman Lugs. We'll see you next time. We'll do. Thanks, man.